I'm appreciating just the, the beautiful messiness of life and how Zen practice allows us to turn that into just uh, jewels, jewels of wisdom, jewels of heart opening. Um, <clears throat> let's say something about that. I want to start off uh, launching off of the end of my previous talk a couple of weeks ago. And some of you were here, maybe saw it online. I was talking about our storytelling. <coughs> how we create stories out of our lives and how <coughs> I found in, in a recent episode of, you know, storytelling, I was in transition and I found myself, you know, very immediately alive, you know, in the environment. But then I also found myself in kind of going into story really quickly, you know, and I, I just could see how I was telling certain things about myself and certain feelings about myself and my life were just coming up. And I really had a, had a, a perspective on it, a witness of it and how kind of shallow and artificial and almost meaningless, you know, that storytelling was. So I wanted to encourage you know, us all in, the, in this practice of just really living fully in the, in the living presence of our moment, because that's that's beyond and within all of the stories that we tell. That's the real essence essence of our lives is that living presence. And I thought we had a really nice discussion around that. And people appreciated how it, it could, um, the storytelling can kind of get us off kilter, you know, or even get us um, perversely motivated. In some ways. But there was, there was also a sense of, well, what about the value of these stories? Is there value in reframing? Or is there value in having these stories? And uh, I wanted to, I wanted to delve deeper into that because I thought those were, those were really good questions, you know, that came up, particularly with, with respect to, you know, reframing the value. So the, I want to reiterate the, the problem, as I see it, that we create when we do this storytelling is, is that we really separate ourselves from the living presence of the moment, our real, our real essence. And we tend to create... Um, sometimes a distorted view of what's going on, but certainly a limited view of what's going on. Because really, this whole universe unfolding is incredibly implicated and interconnected. So when we tell that personal story, you know, we tend to have ourselves as the main protagonist, and we tend to overweigh our agency you know, within this tale. So, you know, setbacks or mistakes tend to be understood in the context of this personal drama as our successes, um, which really is just a very limited view of this whole big catastrophe that's going on. It includes other people and, and collectives and universes and forces and dimensions you know, beyond our understanding. <clears throat> so it's too self-centered, you know, these stories just become too self-centered and, and too limited. And that's the, that's kind of the issue that I have with them. <clears throat> now, a reframing can be helpful, right? It can, it can. I think the primary value is in getting you to drop your previous story. And then you get a new frame and you go, oh, well, it might be this. And then that may, you know, help motivate and encourage you um, and help you to appreciate, you know, some of the finer parts of what's going on with your life. And then you apply yourselves to that. So you just appreciate more deeply the intimacies, the intimacies of your life. All right, I, I got into some Dogen writings just today as I was putting together my uh, newsletter, on Zen at Week Work newsletter, which I sent out just before coming here. I doubt if anybody's read it yet, but I wanted to share some of the things from it because it's really, there's some, some Dogen writings I came upon which were just great. <clears throat> so this goes in the direction of um, a reframing, if you will, 
right? So I want to talk about mistakes and looking at mistakes and how do we look at the mistakes in our lives. So some of you may have heard Dogen's teaching, uh, which is sometimes translated as a Zen master's life is one continuous mistake. Have you heard that? Yeah. So this is um, maybe more accurately translated is um, succeeding a mistake with a mistake. So it's mistake after mistake. A Zen master's life is one of mistake after mistake. Okay, so a little different from one continuous mistake, but kind of kind of the same thrust to it. But I actually like this one even better. Mistake after mistake after mistake. Now, he says a Zen master's life can be a life of mistake after mistake after mistake, and that can be holds holds a real key, which is that it all depends on how you look at the mistake. If you think if you think all you're doing is constantly making mistakes, that's not a Zen inquiry. That's actually not a Zen way of viewing those mistakes. But if you view it in a certain way, now it becomes Zen practice. And that is not only Zen practice, the Zen life is to look at it this way. So what is that way of looking at it? <clears throat> well, Dogen tells a story of walking in the woods. Um, I don't think I need to read this for this because it's pretty, pretty short and sweet. Um, so I'm paraphrasing a little bit. But this is in the Shobo Genzo. <clears throat> Dogen goes for a walk in the woods and he writes this account the next day. He said, last night, yesterday, yesterday afternoon, I went for a walk and I unintentionally stepped on a turd. And the turd suddenly opened up heavens and earth. Then I unintentionally stepped on the turd again and it revealed itself to me as Shakyamuni Buddha. Then I stepped on, unintentionally, I stepped on his chest and the heavens opened for him. He sat on the Vajra seat and had his great awakening experience. Now, this wasn't a metaphor. I want to say this. This happened to Dogen. He's not pretending. He's not tripping, <laughs> you know, on something. This really happened. The heaven and earth opened up for him. Shakyamuni appeared, and then he actually participated in Shakyamuni's awakening 1,700 years after Shakyamuni's awakening in real time. All right. So I think most of us would call stepping on a turd kind of a mistake, right? Understood as it goes against your intention, right? You intend to do something in a certain way and you fail at it, or you do something that doesn't appear to serve that purpose or that path in the way that you expected it to be or the way that you wanted it to be. You didn't intend to step on the turd, and yet, look at this magnificent, you know, outcome, three times, actually. And Dogen actually says he unintentionally stepped on it three times, which seems a little weird. Like, how did that happen? <laughs> did you miss it? So there's a little poetic license in, in this story, I will say, but I will say that the reason that he says he did it unintentionally is to bring out this reality of this teaching. The mistake is when you do something unintentionally and then what can arise from that unintentional. Okay. <clears throat> so if we can look at ourselves that way, and maybe this is a reframing. Maybe this is a reframing. I don't know. We might call it that. That all of our mistakes are actually gateways to awakening or can be. Right? If we look at it that way. But certainly, Dogen was primed for this experience. 
because of his practice. <clears throat> and only then, I would say, was he able to experience Buddha in return, right? because he was primed for that. So that's what our practice gives us, is that, that ability to do that. Left to our own devices, you know, previous to practice, you could say. The story is that stepping in a turd is bad. Okay. And perhaps most people go through their lives absolutely convinced that stepping in a turd is always bad. You never want to do that. If that worldview prevails for you, you're going to be looking at your life in a certain way. You're, in a sense, you're going to be locked into that. But the Dharma you know, is teaching us and, and inviting us to look at our life in a completely different way. And I would say that context, that reframing, if you will, is much bigger, much bigger, much bigger than this self-centered story that we're telling about ourselves. This context, to me, <clears throat> it's the context of karma. That's, that's a story that I find helpful to look at my life in the context of. You know, karma, dharma means law, actually. Right? It's one of the translations of dharma is law, the law of the universe. And karma means action. <clears throat> So the law of karma is that actions produce consequences, causes produce effects. Actions are understood as uh, both behaviors, you know, things you do, as well as things you say, as well as things you think. So body, mind, and thought. Body, mouth, and thought. <laughs> body, mouth, and thought. Things you do, things you say, and things you think. That's action. Those are all actions. Karma. Every one of those produces uh, an effect, has an effect. And the intention, intentional or volitional action produces consequences. That's karmic unfolding, right? So now we have this matter of volition and intention. It produces karmic effects. It also produces unintended effects. <laughs> okay? So the gap between intended effects and actual effects is a mistake. How beautiful this universe is, giving us the opportunity to look every moment at, at our mistakes. We will never have the intended effect of our, you know, I should say, we will never get to a place where the intended effects of all of our actions unfold exactly as we intend them. Come on, <laughs> please don't set the bar that high. More likely, you know, it will be a mess and we'll have some, some effects and some, and some won't be there. <clears throat> yeah. So you could say, well, what if I don't have any intentions? I won't make any mistakes, <laughs> right? And that's true. Yeah, that's true. You, you, could, you could sort of seek to live in that way, but that's not the Buddhist way. That's not the Mahayana way. I mean, honestly, you, you couldn't really do that anymore. You know, it's, it's basically hiding, right? You're just going to, you're just saying, oh, I just want to live purely and not have an effect on anybody. I'll just go with the flow, no matter what. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, more likely, you'll just live a small life and make sure that things, that 
you only experience flows that you can go with. <laughs> but, and then even then, your loved ones will die and your body will fade and you'll wrestle with the difficulties and challenges of life. So it's not really an option. Better to have a big vow, to have a big intention, to have a big purpose, a big goal, a big intention. Yeah, but bodhisattva vows, not only are they big, they're impossible. Save all sentient beings, receive all dharmas. You know, numberless creations, I vow to receive. Numberless creations, really? Wow. They're, they're expli explicitly phrased in this just mind-blowing way, kind of impossible can't really do that. And this is why, to recognize that we're going to fail. We're going to make mistakes. And to accept that, not only lovingly, but, but with almost a scientific, wow, what an opportunity to now keep going with this and, and create uh, in, uh, a work of art out of my life that folds all of those wrong notes and missed strokes and oopses <laughs> into some, you know, masterpiece of messiness, right? That's, that's the way of being with your life that I would uh, invite you into. And to bring it, you know, back to Zazen, because I want to bring everything back to Zazen. It's the main doorway of our practice in Zen, is to be able to reflect on your life in this way, to introspect in such a way that you can see, that you see that you are not this story that you're telling yourself, that you are, you are this profound, energetic unfolding that is powerfully seeded by your own intentions. And then watch what manifests from that. And then you can choose. It becomes almost like a, food, a feedback loop instead of a food back loop. It's, it's kind of that too. <laughs> mistake. Was that a great mistake? <laughs> it's a feedback loop, a feedback loop of reflecting. I'm doing in consequence, doing in consequence. Yeah. <clears throat> the love is, is really, it's really powerful, really, and quite profound. To take a little bit of a sidestep on my main theme here, I just want to um, appreciate how um, inexorable. I guess I would say the world. karma is certainly inescapable. Um, I found in my own life that the things that I avoided for a long time got presented back to me in a way that I, I quite beautifully had a choice whether to accept the things that I had been avoiding or to continue to avoid them or to go in a different direction. And I'm talking personally in my life about avoiding family commitments and relationship commitments. I did that for decades in my life. And then I was presented, and I knew I was avoiding it. I had a story that I was doing it for a good reason and I was making decisions about my life, all of which were true, nevertheless, <laughs> I was avoiding. Avoiding is in the family of ignorance, one of these three poisons or a form of attachment. Avoidance is a form of attachment, okay, which causes suffering. Second noble truth, first noble truth. Yeah. So the law of karma, in this case, you know, more specifically, would say what you resist persists. And in Buddhist terms, it's if you avoid something, you're creating karma from it, you're creating suffering from it, 
and ultimately that's going to that's going to come back to you isn't quite the right phrase. Um, you ultimately you will have to deal with the consequences of your avoidance. Okay. So I, I was presented with the opportunity to take on relationship and family commitments that I had spent 30 years avoiding. And it was a choice. I didn't have to take on this relationship, but I had fallen in love. <laughs> it was like, my heart told me what I was going to do. Myself from five years previously would have been, you're crazy. But my knowing, my higher self knew, no, I'm not. You were crazy. <laughs> you were avoidant. It's okay. It's okay. That was, that was okay. So that was beautiful. I mean, I'm so grateful that I was presented with an opportunity to, to you know, face this karma that I had created. Now I'm creating new karma, of course, because I'm volitionally and intentionally stepping into certain actions. But, so I hope I'm creating even more positive karma than negative karma. But ultimately, even that's a story too. You know? I think there's a lot of truth to it. So I, I would invite you to frame you know, your lives in this way, in the bigger context of karmic unfolding, in the bigger context of the Dharma, when you learn from teachings and from your own self-study. And to continually Recognize your own perfection. Yeah. That it's all absolutely perfect. And uniquely perfect for you. However your life is manifesting. It's all just a wonderful opportunity just to learn and grow and help others if that is your vow. What a, what a, what a great life and a great blessing we have with this life. It doesn't have to go anywhere. It gives you the opportunity Look deep within yourself and discover what it's all about. It's inspiring to you. Now, I appreciate everyone here joining our personal stories together, making a collective story. Who knows where it will lead. somewhere you know, messy and magnificent, I hope.